Welcome to this session where we're going to talk about leveraging Kanban to create the Agile organization. Here's what we have today. So our focus today is going to be around introducing Kanban. So there'll be a quick introduction about Kanban to make sure everyone is on the same page in terms of what Kanban is. And then we're going to move into looking at how Kanban, once it's understood, can be used to literally connect the entire organization and create the agile organization that most of us have been um, looking for and can now be achieved by just connecting uh, a few Kanban boards. So that's the premise for us today. First, understanding Kanban, and second, looking how it can actually be the conduit to make everything in your organization um, aligned, traceable, and connected to make better decisions. This is my profile. I've been a coach for over um, 20 years. Um, I am a master facilitator of the seven habits of highly effective people. And I am going to jump right in into uh, tonight, this morning's um, session. So first, let's make sure we understand Kanban. This is a Kanban card. It's from a company called Toyota and it captures a lot of information. So when you look at this card, um, you see a lot of information, but there's even more behind those barcodes. And you can imagine that they're using a laser gun to read those codes and get even more information. The idea is when someone uses the word Kanban, a Kanban is actually a card, or as translated here, a signboard or billboard that contains everything you need to know about something visually on a card. So this is what a Kanban is. Now, when we look at the way Toyota uses it, right, they use it in manufacturing and they use it to also control inventory system. And they have a whole um, production system called the Toyota production system where, on which you can learn a lot more online at the link below. And you can find out more on how it's used in that environment. Of course, for tonight, today's purposes, we're going to focus on utilizing Kanban, not in a manufacturing setting, but in an organizational setting, trying to track how work is flowing across the organization. So when we talk about Kanban, there are four principles and five properties. The principles, by definition, are at play whether you believe in them or not, which means these things are going to happen and need to happen in terms of when introducing Kanban. So the first thing you need to do as a principle is make sure that you start with what you do now. The beauty of Kanban is it's really not disruptive. The way you start um, introducing Kanban is by asking people to share with you what do they do today. And the only thing you're going to do different is you're going to visualize it on a Kanban board. So change nothing because of the second prop principle that will introduce the idea that if we change nothing up front, then we need to agree once everything is visualized that with this information and using it in this new visual format that we agree to keep making it better. So start simple, keep getting better, and then respect everything. So the third one is about respecting titles, process, everything you do today, because in any lean approach where Kanban comes from lean thinking is that you want to baseline and understand how things are going today, what we call as is, before you start making changes for what we call the to be state. And this is part of that continuous improvement process where you constantly baseline where you were and what exactly are you changing to make it better so that you can calculate whether the changes have been helpful or not, and what changes cause the improvement. Lastly, you will encourage acts of leadership at all level. And what we mean by this is anyone on the team can act as a leader and be very careful with the words. Someone with the title of manager does not equal a leader. Those two words are completely different. The title itself does not make you a leader. Anyone can 
act as a leader in any title or role in a Kanban team or in general. But in Kanban, it is absolutely expected that we respect everyone on the team and that we give a voice to everyone. And if someone has to be our leader for a few hours or a leader for a full day based on their expertise, we take it. So the principles are simple and they're meant to really implement Kanban with almost no friction because we're changing nothing up front. Now it's a little bit of trickery because as soon as everything is in place, we can finally visualize it. And that is where we start making all these improvements. So now that the principles are in place, which are the basic foundation for introducing Kanban, we move to the properties. Now the properties are important because the properties are the things that make you a Kanban team. In order to do Kanban, you must do those five things. The first one, we've already talked about it. It's visualizing your workflow. So that's done by creating cards that are visual on a Kanban board where they'll be flowing on that board. Number two, limit your work in progress or WIP. So I'll explain that better in a second, but the concept is, is just like in manufacturing, where you could imagine there's a factory that uses Kanban or a process that uses Kanban, you need a way to understand what is the capacity of a machine, a team, or the entire organization or factory. In our case, you're gonna see that we're gonna use WIP limits to limit the number of cards in what we call WIP columns. And I'll illustrate, illustrate this better on a board in a few seconds. Thirdly, Measure and manage the flow. This has everything to do with, if you're gonna do something, and remember, we're constantly improving, you need to be able to measure how things are going at any time so that when you see a difference in your numbers, you can pinpoint it back to a change that happened at a certain point in time. So by measuring and managing the flow constantly, you can understand which changes were positive, which changes were negative, and then adjust as a team. You will obviously also be able to track through the throughput, which is one of the key metrics, your performance as a team, and through your cycle time, your responsiveness as a team. So we'll share with you some of these key metrics that are used to measure and manage your flow. Fourth, making the process explicit. What you're going to see is as you build your Kanban board, you're going to naturally add what I call definition of done for each column of your board. This is making your process explicit by clearly stating what does it mean for a card to be completed in a specific column before you can move it to a new column. So the idea here, and this is very powerful, is that when someone joins your team, everything they need to know to function in your team is literally explicitly said on the board, which means we can onboard people extremely fast in a Kanban environment. Lastly, and this you'll hear me mention it multiple times, is Kaizen, the spirit of continuous improvement. So the last property in Kanban is that your team embraces Kaizen. So these five properties are critical and you must do all five in order to call yourself a Kanban team. Now, again, if you need to know more details about all this, this is all available on our website and you'll see that every um, link in the presentation goes to much deeper content about how all this is supposed to work and provide more information. Okay. So let's go back into this. Um, next. So here is how I'm going to introduce Kanban to you guys. I'm going to tell you a story. And this is very typical when you need to explain something complex or even something in general. Storytelling is probably the ideal way to explain something quickly to other human beings. So here is my story. The story I have to tell you is about my daughter. She is, her name is Chloe. She is now 20. And when she was six, um, she, I used to pick her up on Fridays and every Friday she would spend the weekend with me and on Sunday, her mom would pick her back up. And sometimes on Friday, her mom would come over and she would, um, ask my daughter this question. 
hey honey, what did you do this weekend? And my wonderful daughter Chloe would respond sometimes with nothing. And I was like, what? That's it. Next weekend, come on board in the kitchen. You will list your goals for the weekend. We will flow them on the board. Whatever's in the done column is the answer to mommy. Are we clear? Now, this is a real story. So next Friday, when my daughter came over, we went to the pharmacy and we bought a foam board that you would use to do uh, schoolwork. And we created the board that you're seeing right here. To do, in progress, done. And that's how we start every new team that decides to go Kanban, is with the most basic board. Once this board was up, I handed over to my daughter cards and Sharpies for her to write on the card the goals that she wanted to achieve the first weekend. What she came up with was three things. She wanted to go to the movies, um, get some ice cream, and feed the ducks. So she created three cards, she put them in the to-do column, and we started our weekend. On Saturday, we got lucky because the ice cream shop was right next to the movie theater. So we got two cards done in one shot, right? Because we went to the movies and then got some ice cream. And then on Sunday, we went um, a little bit further from our house. There's a park and there was a pond with ducks and we took some um, Cheerios and we threw them in the, the pond and the ducks were happy and we were happy because we completed the three cards that we set up to do for that weekend. Everyone clear that those three cards went from to do to in progress and finally to done. And on Sunday, when the mom came over, it was very clear that we accomplished three things on the weekend. The reason I did this and my poor daughter who was Covey certified by eight, Kanban expert by six, um, often had to go, go through these um, new techniques that I um, used in, a, in the work to make sure they worked, obviously on my daughter. Um, but the key here is that we proved to ourselves that we could do two to three things on a weekend. Now, the reason I believe the tracking is important is because it sets the stage for the whole team, me and my daughter, to know what we're gonna do the weekend. And it also prevents kids or team members to have selective memories. So for example, I don't know if you remember, but sometimes you plan this beautiful trip with your children and um, you go to Disney World and the only thing your kid remembers is the pack of gum that you bought at the Circle K. So this is why sometimes you need to visualize exactly what you're going to do and then have a way to see it. So it prevents any selective memory and importantly, shows the real picture of what is really going on within your team. So this is why um, we start doing Kanban, is just to visualize our work. So that was the first thing with Kanban. Now here's the problem. My daughter is still very smart today, but she was uber smart at six and when she started using her board, she came back to me and said, you know what? I love Kanban. This stuff is magical. The board is pure magic. On Friday, I just write a few things on cards and then two days later, it magically happens. Can you imagine the power I just gave my six-year-old? So she went berserk. And what she did is she started to ask to go to Disneyland every weekend. And she started wanting to do 20 things every weekend. So this is where we had to talk because what we can't do is do 20 things, especially if we've proven to ourselves through metrics that we saw ourselves that two to three things were very realistic. In fact, every time we try to do more than three things, we tended to miss or fail one of the cards. That's why we found out that our sweet spot as a team of two over a weekend was three cards. Now about Disneyland, that was different. I have to cut a deal with her. I have to negotiate that Disneyland was not something we did on the weekend. It's something that we did once a year over a period of a week instead of just two days on the weekend. Now the problem with that is that I hope everyone understands that after that point, we did go to Disneyland every single year because that was a deal we cut as a team 
And integrity is important. So when you cut a deal like this with a customer or with a team member, then you need to fulfill it. So the two things we corrected was expectation on something that was, that was not appropriate, going to Disneyland every weekend, and then the sheer amount of cards. And this is when we introduced whip limits. So whip limits is this idea that for columns that you have on your board that are called work in progress, which means this is where your cards get worked on and there's progress being done on these cards. So for example, the to do column and the done column on this board are not whip column. You can have a million cards in to do and a million cards in done that doesn't matter. What does matter is whatever is deemed a whip column must have a limit. And those are these little red stop signs that you see right now um, on the board. The way we introduce whip limits is by using a very simple formula. There are way more advanced ways to doing this using value stream mapping and more advanced formula. But usually we just go in with a simple one that says, listen, how many people are on your team contributing to the board? How many people there are times two minus one is your going in position for whip limit. So if you're a team of four people times two minus one, you should start your whip limit with seven cards. Now you have to figure out how to spread that whip limit across your board on all your whip columns. And then you need to decide as a team, is seven too comfortable? If it is, then try with eight. Just like I did with my daughter, I was hovering between two and three. If eight is still too comfortable, try nine. What I will tell you right now is there's a point as a team of four that you will not be able to get past. And once you start getting past, you will get counterproductive again. So be very careful with this. The team must find their sweet spot, not the manager or someone in the organization that's gonna impose a whip limit. The whip limit is something you need to experiment with and figure out as a team where that whip limit falls. And the formula I'm giving you is just a quick, easy way to get started with something. So the other thing to realize on this board is there's a new column now. You see the ready column got introduced. We used to have only three columns and now we have a fourth column called ready. Well, why did we have a new column? Well, remember, you're supposed to continuously improve your Kanban board and everything you do. When my daughter was 15, because we did continue to use this board for a long, long time, um, I drove to a theater again because she loved movies. And once I was at the movie theater in the parking lot, my daughter looked at me and said, Daddy, I don't think it's the right theater. And I think you were supposed to pick up my, my girlfriend. So I looked at my daughter and I said, you know what, Chloe? That's it. We need to go back home. Our board is broken. We must fix it and improve it because daddy can't just drive places and then realize after doing the work that the, the work is not the right one. So we went back home and we talked about our board and we end, ended adding a new column called ready. For me, the first column on your board is what I call a thinking column. It's much better to have a thinking column before having a doing column. And a thinking column is a column where the team members can take a moment to make sure that they've really read the card and they've really answered all the questions needed for this card to be successful when it does move forward to a doing column. So this first column of thinking is very important. And so here's how well trained my daughter was the next weekend. She approached me and said, Daddy, the movie name is The Hunger Game. The friend's name is Faith. You do need to pick her up. I do need $20 for the popcorn. And don't worry, her parents will drop us back to your place. So what she did is she used the time in the ready column to talk to her friend, to talk to her parents, to make sure that she had all the information before we could proceed and start working on the card. And that's exactly what you will do in your organization is you will talk to your customers, you will talk to your stakeholders, you will make sure that every information to your subject matter expert is ready before doing the work. In my mind, especially in the world of software development, I believe that software development is closer to 80% thinking 
and 20% doing. So the more you can think up front, the better. Then we need to talk about mechanics. If you have a whip limit, then how does new work come on the board? So the idea in Kanban, and I fully understand that this is counter in, counterintuitive. I'm going to ask a new Kanban team to work on less than they're used to, in this case, only seven cards, yet they're going to produce more. And I fully realize that doesn't make sense when you first hear it. You're going to work on less, but you're going to produce more. Once I explain to you the pull mechanism, the pull process here, you're going to see why this is possible. So keep an eye on the pink card. What's going on here is that as soon as a card gets done, it moves to the done column, which creates a void on your board. You do not have to fill that void immediately. So in the in progress column, there's now a spot for a new card to enter that column. You will look at your previous column, the ready column, and see if a card is ready to move in progress. If that's the case, you will move the card, which will create now a void in the ready column. Once you realize that it's time to bring a card in the ready column, you usually have no problem bringing a card from the to-do because they're all ready to go, hopefully. You will then move a card from your to-do column, and this is how new work enters your board. The only way you can add a new card is if a card exits the board. So you remain at full capacity every day of the year, all the time, but as soon as a card gets done, it creates that pull process to pull the next card. So what I need to make sure is that as you do this, you understand that we have a mantra that we often give our customers, which is stop starting, start finishing. So the idea is that if you want to start new work, you must get better at finishing work. And this is the whole secret behind all this, is you must focus on getting work done by focusing on just a few things. And as those things get completed much faster, because there's less to look at and to work on, you start creating a continuous flow of work that gradually starts flowing faster and faster and faster. So as you keep flowing card, your board might continue to evolve and look something like this, where you keep adding maybe new column and spreading your whip and seeing how your team capacity, your pull system, and your ideal flow of work continues to evolve on your board. So this is what I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page, is that Kanban is just a card, and then those cards are on a Kanban board where they flow from to do to done in this work in progress step that has a whip limit. And then I'm gonna show you later the whole concept of metrics. So this is an example, if you did a Google search on what a Kanban board looks like. It's got the same concept I just showed you. The only difference, and this is important, is it's not just a board. This team has decided to have a board and a separate lane called an expedite lane. The reason I'm showing you this is that a board doesn't have to be a simple table, right? A simple box. It can have a separate lane. It can have actually multiple lanes. It can have columns and it can have rows. It can look however you want as long as you can still enforce whip limits on it. So these are examples. This is a Kanban board where we have multiple rows in only a single column, which is our priority column. We like using the Moscow technique and we like visualizing the Moscow technique on our board by seeing exactly which cards are must, which ones are could, which ones are should, and which ones are won't, right? And then they flow on the board. If you're a crisis management team, you might again leverage the concept of having different types of crisis that might be visualized differently. So in this case, right? There are explicit agreements right here under the first column, and then there's multiple strategies that are different and might involve different people to fulfill those strategies. So the Kanban board visually tells you which type of card and which strategy should be used because simply of looking where the card is on the board. 
You can then use it for sales. So for example, <coughs> and I'll give you a, a secret, Salesforce uses a Kanban board. They don't tell you it's a Kanban board, but because it's the most effective way to visualize work, then many tools like Salesforce have used visual board representation, which are literally Kanban boards. So if you want to look at Salesforce the next time, you will recognize a Kanban board. Now, in this case, I'm literally showing you a Kanban board with a two-step process, when the leads are open and when the leads are closed. And in this case, there's entry and exit criteria in each of the columns. So that's it. That's what I wanted to make sure we were on the same page, is that before introducing you advanced concept at the organization level, I wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page in terms of what is Kanban at its simplest level, because if you understand what a Kanban board looks like and how it works, now I can connect multiple Kanban boards to show you how all this is gonna start working. So in order to embrace an agile organization, you most likely need to have already embraced the agile mindset, which is based on four values and 12 principles. So the first thing is I would assume that you are following the agile manifesto, which is shown here on the left side. Now, if you're gonna do Kanban, you're gonna have to also adopt a lean thinking philosophy. Now, the two things I'm showing you here are referred to as mindset and philosophies. They are key ways of thinking in terms of how to behave as humans and have information to guide us into a healthy direction. So I'm not gonna go into detail of the agile mindset and the lean thinking, I'm just showing them to you quickly here, but they have some of the key concepts, especially on the lean thinking side, to embrace Kanban. And as you can see, the respect for flow and Kaizen are back in picture in the house of lean that I show right here. This is the way to start looking at how you will flow your work across your organization. So the first thing you see here is that I split the organization into three. And those three layers are the three voices that are constantly happening within an organization. So for example, the voice of why, the voice of what, and the voice of how. And this is very important to respect that each lane answers a different voice. So at the highest level, we will call it the portfolio level. And this is where your strategic team, which is most likely made of executives, enterprise architects, and portfolio managers, whoever you believe is strategic and can help your organization set direction should be on the portfolio team. That team is gonna have a Kanban board. And that Kanban board is going to focus on flowing cards of type initiatives. So these cards are the highest level cards in the organization. This is where you know where your head organization is heading. Once you have clear initiatives and they're flowing through your Kanban board, you will want to break these initiatives into smaller pieces, which I will call here features. If your organization is providing products, maybe it's providing services, right? Whatever your organization produces or offers customer is your what level. In this case, we're producing products and those initiatives are gonna be broken into features. These features are going to be worked on by a set of people that work ahead of the team, that have key roles like a product owner, a solution architect, and some subject matter experts that know about this work to help start crafting these features. This Kanban board is strictly about flowing features at a level where we focus on transforming the why into clear what information. And at this level, the features um, get all the information needed so that the teams on the third level can start breaking those features into stories. So now we can get to the third level where the teams are now focused on how to do the work. And this is where the teams collaboratively will take a feature 
and break it into stories. And this is where you would expect your engineers, your analysts, your testers to start now digging into the lowest level detail that is the most important to them to actually deliver work. Now be careful. There is full alignment and traceability in this model. The stories all connect back to a feature. The features all connect back to an initiative, which means everyone working in an organization like this has complete understanding of the context of the work and why they're doing the work, what is the work, and finally, if you're on the team, having the right to dig into how to do the work, okay? So this is the concept. Now on the left side, we have also the five levels of planning in Agile that we typically experience. You should have a vision, you should have a roadmap, you will most likely conduct a release planning session. And if you're doing Scrum or Kanban, you most likely will have the concept of iteration, also, although optional in Kanban, you can mimic it if needed. And then definitely every day, you will have this level of planning called the daily Scrum. So these five levels of planning go across your organization in parallel to your three boards. So conceptually, this is what you would do across your organization using, in this case, a minimum of three connected Kanban boards. Now, this is what Portfolio Kanban is. It's the idea that you manage a portfolio of work on your strategy board, for example, and these could be your highest initiatives or projects, whatever you want to call them. You then break them into what we like to call a discovery board. And then the discovery board gets broken into um, team boards. So in this case, initiative purple um, got broken into one feature and that feature got broken into three cards. Those three cards all went to team one. On the green project, it got broken into two features and those two features actually engaged two separate teams. So the idea is that at any given point, you know exactly what is going on in your organization. So I'll illustrate this quickly on this board. Same concept, two initiatives, a green one and a red one. Each of them have features that are right here. And then in my example, I have only one team and I'll move back these cards right here to show you how it's going. So I'm going to focus on the green feature the green initiative it's going to get approved as soon as it's approved it's going to send a trigger that we can start working on it now at this point you might not have the feature written um, so you would write the feature as soon as you write the feature you will move it in design and once you move it in design you will see that it triggers to the other board that something is happening within your parents and children relationship so now that this feature is moved into design, you will most likely write your green stories. So now the green stories are written. You will then move these green stories gradually through your board. And so these cards that are associated with this thing are gonna start moving through your board. And as they start hitting done, right, you should actually, as soon as they moved into your board, have moved this one into implement and this one into track. And now as they start hitting done, you now have information at this level that things are happening and you can track them also here, right? Because you have that full relationship. I'm going to keep moving my cards until they all make it to the done level. Once they're all done, you should trigger here that this card is now ready to validate. Once you validate that everything is good, you may mark it as done. Once you do that, you now trigger this card to move into a measure state. And once it's measured, the card is done. So what I just showed you is how easy it is when you have the portfolio board in place, maybe a discovery board, and then one or multiple team board that all the cards are connecting and sending each other information so that every layer of the organization can take action in their realm of focus so that they move. And as you can see, each board has different columns because they have a different process. So each team must build the Kanban board that represents the way they work, okay? So this is the mechanics behind what I was showing you right here. So you will get alignment, you will flow 
everything more efficiently because they'll have a real focus on priority. And also the cards that you are moving are the cards that are clearly the next one in line. Everyone knows at any given time what should be our focus. And this is the secret between the, within any agile technique, whether you're doing Scrum, XP, Kanban, is laser focus. When you help your team focus, that's why we have those whip limits and they're low, is that when people focus, they tend to do a great job and they tend to do it well and fast, okay? Then every board will keep improving. Every team will have the spirit of Kaizen. And then, I already mentioned focus, we will visualize the whole thing on a simple visual way within your entire organization. Conceptually, if you're using a three board approach, then your green initiative will connect to a green card on this board and this green card will connect to green cards on this one, okay? Keeping it simple. Now, some organization don't want to create the, four, the three levels. They're not ready for that. And all they wanna do is track only two levels and say, listen, I don't have the whole organization on board yet, so I'm only going to track my projects on one board and then the deliverables of these projects on my team board. So you can go the full transformation, which is what we do with most organization. Or if you want to just solve one department's, you know, flow, not the whole organization. And for that department or area, you just want to track two levels, then track two levels. But the connection between a project board and a team board will help your team flow work efficiently by not overburdening themselves on the project board. Because if you bring in too many projects, then you will hurt yourself on your teams. So this is, this is the whole concept in Kanban is to keep every board in a state that is healthy so that it doesn't overburden downstream other teams. So that's why you use these project board or these higher level boards as valves to make sure that you don't inundate your organization with too much work. Remember, your first reaction is, well, I need to push work. No, you don't. You need to pull work. And every time you're going to keep pushing work by just screaming at people, it's not going to move any faster. In fact, I believe it's going to move slower because there'll be more conflict and there'll be more issues. If you let your teams and you trust your teams to flow work the most ideal way, they will do it. So now I'm moving away from doing just a product approach. When we go and transform large organizations, we not only solve the problem for product development using Kanban, but we also introduce things like, what about your customer system? What is, how do you customers communicate with us? And a lot of our customers use tools like ServiceNow, which are service level tools where customers would log incidents and then those incidents would turn into tasks that can be delivered on a team board. So you can apply the concept of connected board in any situation. In this case, we would have only two boards here. Now for improvements, when we have, we complete a transformation of a large organization, we introduce improvement communities or centers of excellence around certain concepts. And these improvement communities will benefit from using Kanban boards, where you could see all the improvements being prioritized and requested on a improvement board. And then based on the request, teams will receive tasks associated with these improvements on their respective boards. So you can imagine that a team might receive blue stories, green tasks, and red tasks on their team boards because there's multiple sources of work coming to them on their team boards. <coughs> so again, enterprise looking, this is how you can really turn this Kanban concept into a way of really connecting everything in your organization. Which brings me to the metrics. So if you're gonna use Kanban everywhere in your organization to connect everything, then you need to use certain metrics 
to measure and manage the flow now, not only at a board level, but across your organization, since everything is on board. The first metric that we need to talk about is the throughput. This is what we call the performance of your team. In this case, this team has been tracking their throughput, right? And it seems that they were doing really strong at one point, they were probably hovering around 70 cards every month, and then something changed, and now they're hovering more around, I would say, 30 cards every month. The idea here is you'd have to understand why the downshift of throughput and see if it's really a problem, if it's just a different way of creating cards, or if the team has really maybe um, lost a few people and that's why the productivity has now gone lower. Ultimately, your throughput keeps you honest in terms of, am I still performing the way I'm supposed to? But be careful, there will be one day where if your team doesn't change, where you will plateau and reach your ultimate throughput. Now you can always find ways to improve it, but it will be through things like automation or um, Kaizen events where you create more Kaizen cards to improve something in your process. So throughput is just tracking how many cards hit the done column on a given time frame. In this case, it's month, but it could be weeks or it could be days. So this is how you use your throughput to understand the performance of your boards or your team. The next one is cycle time. So cycle time is about responsiveness. So this is a different metric. This one calculates from the moment a card enters a whip column to the moment a card exits a whip column into a done column. This is what we call the cycle time of a team. It's the time spent on the cards themselves. And in this case, you will track it to get a better understanding of which types of card take time more than others. So in our case, if you look at the data, um, these regression failures took only one day to turn around, where our bugs took six days to turn around, right? So the idea here is if you have different types of work flowing on our board, you, would, you might experience different cycle times. For example, our Kaizen cards took even longer. They took nine days in average. Now our overall average of our board was four days because that's the average of all the types of cards. So this starts giving you information that if you're gonna request work from this team, it will most likely take around four days, but some things might take a little bit longer and some things might take a little bit less. So this is why you use cycle time, is to gauge the responsiveness of a team. Now you can visualize cycle time two ways, or those are the two ways we use, through a line chart like this one to understand the progression of each type of work or on a scatter plot. And the advantage of a scatter plot is that there's these control limits right here that show you that your cards stay within the control limits and the ones that do not are considered outliers. And you must learn from these outliers to understand what did you do differently or what could you do better to make sure um, that we focus on them. So at this point, um, you can notice that the team was all over the place at first. In the first few months, they were really all over the place. And as they matured as a team, you can see there's still some outliers, but they're not as bad because the team is starting to function as a unit and being much more predictable about their cycle time, which is what will happen if you keep a team together and they start learning together they will get much more predictable over time and stay within their control limits. So <clears throat> the last thing I want to put on the table <clears throat> is the concept of providing estimates in Kanban. For me, estimates are always wrong. In fact, if you read the definition of an estimate, by definition, it is not accurate. So if an estimate is never accurate, then why do we spend so much time creating things that are not accurate? In Kanban, we have a way to provide estimates, but without estimating. And this is by leveraging our whip limits and our cycle time. So with those two pieces of information, you can actually solve the mystery at Disneyland of how do they know 
that when someone is standing right here, that it's gonna take 30 minutes. How can they figure this out? Are they using camera, some voodoo magic? Like what are they doing to know that it's gonna take this long? They are using Kanban. Now, not directly, but the same concept. Their ride can only sit three people. Their whip limit is three people can go on the ride. The length of the ride, I'm gonna call it minutes instead of days, is five minutes. Every time you go on the ride, it takes five minutes and you can only sit three people. If you're the fourth or the first person in line, then you are most likely five minutes away from getting on your ride. If you're the fourth person in line, then you are 10 minutes away to go on your ride, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reason we don't waste time estimating in Kanban is we don't need to because our board can give us this information. Now be very careful. It does expect that most of your cards are roughly the same size, which is what a mature team will eventually achieve doing Kanban. They will break their cards and write their cards in a way that they are roughly the same size, which will permit to do what I just shared with you. So you see, this is why Kanban is so powerful, is with only two data points, we can actually save a ton of time that is usually wasted in providing estimates. Now I will say this, I do like estimation sessions because I don't use them usually for estimating. I use them for people to ask questions and learn more about the work by trying to provide estimates. So they're not completely wasteful. It's just if you ask me, if I prefer to spend hours estimating or just quickly answering someone with, hey, here's how long it's gonna take for your card, I would immediately use the Kanban process. So Kaizen is just a slide that I put back in here to make sure that you know that it's a real thing and these are the elements of Kaizen. And I've mentioned this throughout the presentation. That's it for today. So this is what we wanted to show you. We wanted to make sure that you were uh, familiar with Kanban before we went into the advanced topics. And then we moved into organizational flow, portfolio Kanban, Kanban metrics, and Kaizen. I'm now gonna pause to take some questions. And I saw some questions already in the chat. So let's go for it. And the first question has to go back to um, any program board between project and portfolio. So the first question here that I got was, do you have anything between project and portfolio? Well, if you're doing it this way, you're omitting your portfolio level. So if you want your portfolio level, then you definitely want to add it here, right? So the idea, um, if you want something in between though, if you're asking if there could be something in between, between portfolio and projects, right? Then that's completely up to you. What I will tell you is you have to be careful here. You don't want to just keep adding layers and layers of Kanban boards. So the challenge here, and you've been unmuted, so now you're more than welcome to, to, to talk to me, is um, you want to keep it simple, guys. And your portfolio board, the highest board in your organization, is the board that rules them all. So that board is where everything stems from. So you don't want to have too many layers between that board and the people doing the work. Then there was another question, a little bit more on center of excellence. So center of excellence, really guys, the reason I love using Kanban for them is I hate working with the center of excellence where I have no clue what they're doing. So the key here is if you're going to create a center of excellence, you need to declare what is your charter? What are you going to be doing as a center of excellence? But then anyone in the organization should be allowed to visually see what you're truly focusing on and what your team is actually improving or doing for the organization. And the simplest way to do this is to have a Kanban board. So I'm going to pause to see if there's more questions around the concept of using Kanban around a center of excellence. Okay. So there was another question of, is throughput the same as velocity? Yes, so velocity is there to help your scrum team plan your next sprint, 
and you base it on your average velocity. You would do the exact same thing in Kanban, but using your throughput, which is an average of cards getting done. Velocity in Scrum and throughput in Kanban are used the same way to plan your next round of work. So those two are similar. Now, there's another question around swim lanes. Yes, swim lanes on Kanban boards are very uh, common, but they're not required. So this board has no swim lane, but this one has four of them. This one does not have swim lane across the board. It just has it in one column. So you can absolutely do swim lanes. And the most common type of swim lane is what we call um, expedite, fixed state, standard, and then intangibles. So that's what we call classes of services. So if you're going to use swim lane, you can invent your own swim lane like we did here based on strategies that mean something to you, or you can adopt the standard way of doing it in Kanban where you declare an expedite track, a fixed date track, a standard track, and an intangible track. And those are things that if you want to learn more, you can find on our website, classes of services. If you look for that, you will find a article that will show you exactly what I just um, explained to you. And you will be able to find um, this concept of expedite, fixed state, standard, intangible on a Kanban board. Any other questions? I've answered all the questions I could see in this chat. Is yeah, there... I have one more question actually. Yes. Uh, you were explaining about uh, uh, the WIP and the cycle time for estimate. And uh, uh, the thing should be roughly set and it should be on the same size, right? So what if, if uh, it is uh, taking a, a more time than usual? So what we can do about that? Yeah, so, so be careful, right? Estimates continue to be estimates. Even though I'm using scientific numbers here, they're still estimates. So you can't expect them to be perfect. In fact, if you go to Disneyland, you understand if someone, I'm sorry for the visual, but if someone throws up in the ride, then the ride might get delayed. Or if someone needs help to get on and off the ride, then something might be delayed. So what I want to put on the table here is although you will have estimates and expectations of work getting done in a certain time, they still are not perfect. They will never be perfect because life happens. So if it goes longer, well, just like on the ride, you can't plan for someone throwing up in your ride before yours, then you need to expect that these are just estimates. Now, does that cause you to change anything? Well, you will over time, if your estimates continue to be wrong all the time, they will adjust because your cycle time will change. Your cycle time might become longer and therefore your estimates will be further than five days. Maybe after a while, your team will adjust and say, listen, it's no longer five days, it's seven days now and it's tracked on an average. But what I can't promise you here, guys, is when I tell you it's five days, that is still an estimate. Okay, got it. But one more question I have. Uh, actually, uh, cycle time is the same as the customer gets the value of the service or the product, right? Or it's the lead time, actually. So be careful. Lead time is what happens before the work hits your board. Lead time has nothing to do with your team. It has to do with how long your card stayed in the backlog or to-do column, which means not in WIP. Cycle time is your WIP time. It's the time that your team spends. It might have taken five days to do the work, but the card had a lead time of two months. So the card, from the time the customer asked for something, it stayed on the portfolio board for a few weeks. Then it stayed on the discovery board for one month. Then it stayed in our backlog for two weeks. The card in the eyes of your customer has already been given to you two months ago. The fact that your team only took five days to deliver it is not the full time it took. It's only the cycle time of what it took once the card 
was taken in with. To your customer, they don't care that it took five days. What they know is that it took two months and five days. And that's why you need to look at your lead time. Often your problem is not your cycle time. It's your lead time. It's the time it takes to approve work. It's the time it takes for people to move the work and to prioritize it for your team to take it. And that's why I'm so happy that you're asking about lead time. It's a complete different metric. It works exactly the same way. You can also have different types of cycle time. So you can actually describe your cycle time to be only for development, which in this case could be two days, or for testing. Your cycle time for testing is only three days. My point I'm making here is be careful. Cycle time is related to your whip columns, where your lead time could be related to the whip of multiple boards or multiple events that happen prior to a card hitting your board. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I got it. Perfect. Is lead time very, is, is there any analogy to, to the whip of the larger level, like the, the portfolio level? Absolutely. All boards should have whip limits. So for example, when you, when you work on, on this level right here, I expect the discovery team to have a whip limit and I expect the, the uh, portfolio team to also have whip limits. So the idea here is that every board embraces whip limit and every board has its own cycle time. So for me, if I'm a team, my cycle time is only what's on my board, but hopefully the other boards were careful with their cycle time. And this is why in most organizations, they only ask us to do Kanban or Scrum at the team level. And that's the mistake. If you only do it at the team level, this is not where most of your issues are. In Kanban, we talk about upstream and downstream. And I will tell you right now, most of your problems are not downstream, they're upstream. So if you don't visualize your executives on board, how they make decisions, how they, they, they prioritize, how they approve work, and you don't track your middle of your company, people who actually transform the work to be actionable. If you don't have these in place and you're putting all your money on your team, you're putting all the pressure on your team and this is not where your issues are. I'm not saying there's no things to improve at the team level, but your biggest bang for your buck is actually at the higher levels. So be careful with that. In Kanban, you'll, you'll hear the words upstream and downstream constantly. When you do a root cause analysis of why does it take two months to deliver anything, your root cause analysis will point the finger not at your team, maybe one or two things could be fixed at your team, but it will point the biggest area of improvement has nothing to do with your team. So this is why I get excited about this, is don't hire someone to just implement Scrum or Kanban at your team level. It's good, but it doesn't solve the real problems of your organization. That's why I'm calling this presentation Leveraging Kanban to create the real Agile organization, the one where every level is accountable, and that's how you become faster time to market. It's not by just screaming at your teams. It's by having everyone follow the same concept. Sorry, I got a little excited on this one. Excellent. Thank you. I do have one more food if there's time. Yes, for we'll the last one. Just a simplified team level uh, Kanban board. Uh, yes. I've encountered this with my, with my uh, organization. What happens when you have kind of a one-off task that has an outside dependency once it's being worked on? Yeah, so for me, I always instruct my teams to never start a card if the dependency is not resolved. That's in theory. The problem is, is if you always wait for your dependencies to be resolved, you're gonna cause some delays. So sometimes you're gonna try to work around your dependency but there's a point where you can't anymore. Even if you mock up the interface, mock up the data and try to work around by mocking everything to kind of, um, to kind of um, create you know, a scaffolding of what should be provided with you once the dependency is gone, it is you still have to wait for the final dependency to be resolved. And the problem with that is you're gonna have to block your card on your Kanban board. You will give a visual signal that you are blocking the card and saying, listen, until my dependency is gone, I can't move this card any further and stop asking me about the card. 
the card is blocked, read the block reason and go talk to the person who's blocking this card. Thank you. So I will pu uh, publish this presentation. Um, I will send an email to everyone that joined this call and you're more than welcome to follow up directly with me um, through LinkedIn or through uh, email, whatever works for you. So I'm looking forward to speaking to you guys again. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day.